Are you ready to bring a Bible? All right, open it up now, Acts chapter 11. Open it up, turn it on, whatever you need to do. (laughs) Father in heaven, thank you that we can come together this morning. And Lord, I I just thank you for this global media outreach and that it's it's a way that you're reaching people literally in every country of the earth. How wonderful that is, Lord. And so we pray for your blessing on it. And I pray that you'd call many people among our congregation to be online missionaries, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity we have right here, right now, to get into your word and to feed our soul on Jesus and on his truth for us. So do it, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 11 today, we come to this great, great section where... The gospel is going to establish a brand new, wonderful beachhead in a city that we really haven't had occasion to mention yet. So far in the book of Acts, we've talked about Jerusalem a lot. We've talked a little bit about Samaria. We've talked a little bit about Judea. We've talked about some of the other places. But now we're going to come to understand a new place in the geography of the book of Acts. And it's an exciting city called Antioch. Let me read our text for us this morning, starting Acts chapter 11, verse 19, where we read, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now many chapters ago, way back in Acts chapters 6 and 7, we learned about the persecution that came upon the Christians in Jerusalem over the persecution of Stephen. When Stephen was persecuted and became the first martyr of the church, it was as if the church had to scatter because of the great wave of violence that came upon Christians in the aftermath of that martyrdom. And so as all these Christians were being persecuted, they scattered. They went all over the place. And right here in chapter 11, verse 19, it's telling us some of the places where they went. So again, get the idea. It's starting in Jerusalem. Now, as I mentioned to you, we're talking a little bit about geography here. And if this little map will show you from time to time through this morning's study. But if you think of the Roman world as basically being surrounding the Mediterranean Sea as sort of a lake right in the middle. And all around the Mediterranean Sea, you have the Roman Empire. Off on this one corner of the empire is Jerusalem. And Jerusalem takes up that space, uh, focusing in a little bit more. It shows that this place, Jerusalem, uh, it was from the place where the disciples were scattered. And then the text mentions three places, all of them northward of Jerusalem, where they went. They went to a place called Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Now, in those particular three places, all of them northward of Jerusalem, That's where the gospel would spread next as these accidental missionaries. These weren't people who purposed to be missionaries. These weren't people who faced a great missionary call. Do you know what their missionary call was? Run for your life. That was their missionary call. (laughs) But when they ran for their life and they went to other places, you know what they took with them? They took with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and it changed their life. And they couldn't help but talk to other people about it. So verse 19 tells us that when they first went out, they were preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. You see, at first, these Christians who were scattered all over the Roman Empire, they preached only to Jews because it was very much fixed in their minds that the gospel was for the Jewish people and not for Gentiles, especially not for pagans. But eventually, they began to preach the gospel to Gentiles also. That's what it tells us in verse 20. Look at it there. It says, Some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. They spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now these unnamed disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene are really genuine heroes. They were the first 
deliberate mission to the Gentiles, and there they're called Hellenists in verse 20, that we ever saw on the face of the earth. Now, I need to make a little bit of a distinction because you might be thinking, wait a minute, David, the last three times in the book of Acts, we've been studying all about this man Cornelius and how Cornelius was a Gentile, but he came to Christ. Well, wasn't he the first? Well, yes and no. You got to understand the difference here. Cornelius was definitely a Gentile. But he was a special category of Gentile that is called in the Bible and is known in the culture as a God-fearer. In other words, he was a Gentile man who loved the God of Israel. He was a Gentile man who was serious about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a Gentile man who modeled his life after much of the Mosaic Law, but not all of it. So although he was not technically a Jew, in his heart and his mind he was. This Gentile outreach here, it's going to pagans. I mean, people who aren't coming from, I honor the God of Israel. These are people who had honored Zeus or, or other weird gods of the Roman and pagan world. And this is the big difference as the gospel goes out into these areas. You see, in Antioch, we have the very first example of Christians deliberately targeting Gentiles for evangelism and this effort had great results. Do you see it in verse 21? It says, a great number believed and turned in the Lord. Isn't that thrilling? I mean, they, they brought the gospel to these people, to these pagans, and who even knew if the gospel would work for pagans? Who, who even knew they would come and resonate with them? Who knew that they would grab onto it? But it did. They wanted the forgiveness of sins. They wanted the newness of life. They wanted to be cleansed in the atonement that Jesus offered. Therefore, in verse 20, when it says that they came to Antioch, they came to a very important place in the ancient world. Antioch sort of an interesting city, if I could just sort of talk about its history just for a moment. Antioch was founded about 300 B.C. by a man named Seleucus I. He was one of the inheritors of Alexander the Great's empire. Now, Seleucus had sort of a bad habit, you could say, maybe a little compulsive, he loved to found cities in his dominion, and he loved to name those cities after his father, who was named Antioch, or Antiochus. So he founded, oh, about a dozen or more cities, about 15 cities, called Antioch. Great, thank you very much, Seleucus. <laughs> well, this particular Antioch that he founded is more commonly known as Syrian Antioch or sometimes Antioch on the Orontes, because that was the river that it was upon. Now, it was a prosperous, thriving city in that day. Today, it numbers just in the tens of thousands. But in the ancient world, Syrian Antioch, or Antioch on the Orontes, was a thriving city of about half a million people. And by the way, folks, in the ancient world, in the Roman world, it was understood to be the third greatest city of the Roman Empire. Now, it was only about 300 miles north of Jerusalem and about 20 miles inland from the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. But again, many people considered Syrian Antioch to be the third greatest city. The first greatest city in the Roman Empire, of course, would be Rome. The second greatest city in the Roman Empire would be Alexandria in Egypt. But the third greatest city would be Syrian Antioch. It was known for its business, for its commerce, for its sophistication and culture, but especially Antioch was known for its immorality. It had a well-established reputation for moral laxity. They had cults, religious cults in Antioch that, that were well-established and very popular that were just basically, well, it was prostitution with a religious veneer. You would go and worship the pagan gods, but you would worship the pagan gods by consorting with prostitutes. And there was just a huge infrastructure centered around this immorality. It was an unbelievably immoral place. According to one commentator that I read, there was an ancient Roman senator named Juvenal, and he wanted to describe the decadence of Rome. And when he wanted to describe the decadence of Rome, he said basically this, the waters of the Orontes, that's the river associated with Antioch, the waters of the Orontes have flowed into the Tiber. The Tiber is the uh, river associated with Rome. In other words, and we're becoming like Antioch to describe the decadence of Rome. 
It was a proverbial place for being wicked and licentious. You know, think about this. Think about the different character of the cities of the New Testament world. You know, if you want to say uh, Jerusalem was all about religion, Rome was all about power, Alexandria was all about intellect, Athens was all about philosophy, and if you wanted to add to that, you could say that Antioch was all about business, it was a business center, but it was also all about immorality. Those things really marked it. I gotta say, as I was reading this, I was thinking, what's Santa Barbara all about? Well, I don't know, I mean, I have my thoughts, but I wouldn't mind if you send me an email or tell me what you think. I'm kind of interested to know what you people think. What's Santa Barbara all about? If Jerusalem's about religion, if Rome's about power, if Alexandria's about intellect, if Antioch is about business and, and, uh, and immorality. I just want you to think about it. Maybe get back to me on that somehow. Send me an email or, or just talk to me. Tell me what you think Santa Barbara is all about. Because I think each individual place has its own character, its own challenges. But anyway, when the gospel came to Cornelius and he became a follower of Jesus, as I said before, it came to a man who was already a God-fearer. He had a respect for the God of Israel and he lived a moral life. But when it came to Antioch, it came to an utterly pagan city. But look at the great result. Verse 21, it says that the hand of the Lord was with them and therefore a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Man, I love that. A ministry can never turn people to the Lord unless the hand of the Lord is with them. You know, you can turn people to a personality without the hand of the Lord. You, you can turn people to a social club without the hand of the Lord. You can turn people to an institution without the hand of the Lord. But you can't pe turn people to the Lord without the hand of the Lord at work. And notice that it also says right there in verse 21 that it says that they believed and turned to the Lord. I've got to say, I, I can't pass this by, even though I don't want to dwell here. I'm not going to camp out on this because we talked a lot about it last week, frankly. But don't you see, believed and turned to the Lord. Is that not simply another way of describing faith and repentance? Believed, that's faith, right? Turned to the Lord, that's repentance. That's turning away from your sin and turning now unto the Lord. Faith and repentance, faith and repentance, those two go together like hand and glove, they're one part. You could say that faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. Same coin. It's what it means to come to God. If you're going to come to God, you've got to have faith and you've got to have repentance. Two sides of the same coin. Well, as things were going so well in Antioch, look at how it continues here, verse 22. It says, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So, verse 22 tells us that they sent out Barnabas. Although, aren't you fascinated by it in verse 22? How it says that news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Doesn't that... All right, I, I just trust you're going to follow. It sounds creepy to me, doesn't it? It sounds a little bit like Jerusalem is like this headquarters, and, and everybody's telling Jerusalem what's happening, right? Now, I like what James Montgomery Boyce said about this. He said, news was always getting back to Jerusalem, and I suppose it is always that way. Whenever anything is done, there is always somebody who will run to those who are supposed to be important and say, do you know what's going on? And that's what was happening in Jerusalem, right? Well, God was doing a great work in Antioch, so news we got back to Jerusalem. And what did they do? Verse 22 tells us that they sent out Barnabas. They sent a very able man who was well-suited to take a look at what God was doing in these different Gentile cities, especially in Antioch. And look what happened in verse 23. It's so thrilling. It says, and when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. At the church in Antioch, when Barnabas saw the grace of God, he was glad. Now, I've got a question for you. How do you see the grace of God? I don't know. I mean, is it like a color on somebody's face? Is it like a glow around them, like a little halo, a little light shining in the back? Isn't that interesting? Because when I say he saw the grace of God, I think pretty much all of you, yeah, I know what he's talking about. But when you think about it, 
There's no tangible way that we commonly speak of that you see the grace of God, yet undeniably where the grace of God is reigning, where the grace of God is at work, you see it and you know it, don't you? You just feel it. It's an atmosphere. God is glorified. Jesus is exalted. His love, His grace is just filling the atmosphere of the place instead of a, a, a thing marked by rules and legalism and, and disappointed expectations. And you're not measuring up. Instead, the love and the goodness of God flows all over everything. You know, in whatever gathering of Christians we associate ourselves with, it's important that other people be able to see the grace of God among us. There should not be an emphasis upon self. There should not be an emphasis on man-made rules. There should not be an emphasis on human performance, on what you got to do for God. Although, look, that's a part of it, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on what? On what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And how that changes our life. And on how that transforms us. On the glorious grace of God. And I love what it says in verse 23. When he saw the grace of God, what? He was glad. It'll make you glad too. I don't know. I want so much for our church to continue to be. And if I could say it, increasingly be. I'll say what the Apostle Paul said. That he wanted it to abound more and more. I want our congregation to be an atmosphere of grace. And here's what it is. When you live in that atmosphere of grace, it's really easy to kind of take it for granted. It's like, yeah, that's just kind of how it is. But let me tell you, when you don't live in that atmosphere of grace, you long for it. You fantasize about it. And I mean that literally. You dream of it. One of the best illustrations ever heard of it. I didn't make this illustration up, but I thought, man, this is a good one. One of the best illustrations about this is that grace is like good weather. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. You live in Santa Barbara, for heaven's sakes. You live in one of the most beautiful weather spots in the entire earth, right? Sunny, nice, breezy, not humid. I mean, oh, when, when it's cloudy in the morning, we whine and complain, right? Oh, dreadful. There's some clouds. It's a little bit overcast outside. Now, listen, I, I never really got that until I lived in Germany for seven years. And I lived in a particularly wet part of Germany. It's supposedly the second rainiest part of Germany. And let me tell you, it stunk. <laughs> the weather was bad. It was cold. It was wet. It was dreary. And you know what? People obsessed about the weather in Germany. Here it's like, yeah, sunny day. Yeah, who cares? Whatever. When we lived in Germany, if you woke up in the morning and the sun was shining and the sky was blue, you got excited. It was like, oh man, this is great. And if you had three or four sunny, beautiful, blue sky days in a row, it would make the news at night. No fooling. (laughs) And when you went on vacation, what you wanted was sun for sure, right? You fantasized about good weather. Now, friends, that's what it's like for people who don't live in a grace atmosphere. Then, When you live in the midst of it, you just sort of take it for granted. But when you don't have it, you long for it. Listen, I, not only do I want us to have a grace atmosphere here, you might know people who really need that grace atmosphere. You might know people who they're, they're fantasizing about what we have here. And I want it to be that way more and more for us. Anyway, it was so good what God was doing among the Christians there in Antioch that look at what Barnabas did. Verse 23 says that he encouraged them that with all purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. He said, listen, I'm coming here and I'm going to correct you guys. I'm just going to encourage you. God's doing something good here. Let's see it happen more and more and deeper and deeper. All for the result that verse 24 tells us that a great many people were added to the Lord. That's a glorious, glorious thing. The church was healthy. The church was vibrant. The church had an atmosphere of grace. And let me tell you, an atmosphere of grace is magnetic. It draws people unto the Lord. That's exactly what we want here. Now, things were going so well that, at least in my mind, I'm going to embellish just a little bit on the text. I don't think I'm going too far astray. But things were going so well that Barnabas was getting burnt out. Look at it here, verse 25. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. 
Isn't that interesting? Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Things were going so great in Antioch that I can just imagine Barnabas. Barnabas saying, I got more work than I can do. There's so many people coming to the Lord. There's so many people to instruct. I need help. Who's going to help me in this work? Now, man, I hate to sound so negative about the Jerusalem church. I really, somebody's going to punch me in the face when I get to heaven for talking bad about the Jerusalem church. But I'm just going to say, don't you think it's interesting that we don't read about Barnabas sending back to Jerusalem for help? I, all right, it's not my notes. I'm just going to speculate a little bit here. Honestly, usually I'll leave this kind of speculation for Sunday nights. There I really ramble off on different things. But don't you think that just maybe Barnabas is thinking, oh, I shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to say it. If it's wrong, just forgive me. Don't you think Barnabas is saying, this is going so good in Antioch, I can't let the guys in Jerusalem screw it up. <laughs> right? You get headquarters involved, and what happens? Oh, my gosh. So it's like, okay, we need help, but not from Jerusalem. Again, Lord, if I'm unfair in that, then just let that wash from your minds. But I, look, it could be that, right? It could be that. Because as far as we know, he doesn't go to Jerusalem for help. He says, man, I need help. And not that far away, just across. Now, I'm not acting like this was a short distance. It was a long distance, but it was closer than the 300 miles south to Jerusalem. He says, across the water there is Tarsus. And I remember there's a guy we left several years ago, a guy I encouraged in his early Christian life, Saul of Tarsus, who had a remarkable conversion and immediately started preaching. This man is usable. This man is an instrument in God's hand. So what did he do? It says that he departed, verse 25, for Tarsus to seek Saul. It's not difficult to think of Barnabas being exhausted and overwhelmed by all the work, all the opportunities there in Antioch, and then remembering Saul of Tarsus. And so he goes there and he sought them. And from what I understand, in the original Greek here, it's very intensive. In other words, he hunted him up. It wasn't easy. It wasn't just like he looked in the phone book or something like that. He had to search high and low, but he found him. He was dedicated to him because he needed to get that man and bring him into the work. So verse 26, it says, So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So together Barnabas and Saul taught a great many people, making the church in Antioch strong. If you had a time machine, wouldn't you love to go back there for that year of Saul and Barnabas teaching the church in Antioch? Wouldn't that be great? Just thrilling. A remarkable work of God happening among a pagan people in such an unlikely place. You walk the streets of Antioch and you're shocked by the immorality all around you, by the degradation, by the bondage, by the moral filthiness. But nevertheless, in the midst of that, there's a shining light of God's grace and transforming power happening right there in Antioch. And there's Barnabas, there's Saul, they're teaching the Christians there and it's making a strong church and the work is going on and on. It's just wonderful. Now, Saul had been in Tarsus, by some accounts, it's a little tough with the, with, the, with the chronology here, but by some accounts, Saul had been some 12 years in Tarsus since we last met him. Those years weren't wasted, those years weren't lost. He were preparing him for quiet ministry and preparation for future service. And he came to Antioch and started a public preaching ministry that started to shake the world. You know, in time, that church in Antioch became a center for great preaching and teaching. Antioch had some of the greatest preachers ever to walk this earth. You had Barnabas and Paul and Peter. And then in the second century, you had Ignatius and Theophilus. And in the third and fourth century, you had Lucian and Theodore and Chrysostom and Theodoret. Amazing preachers there in that city of Antioch. But I want you to see something. You think of the great, if I could say it, the great pulpit ministry going on there in Antioch. Wouldn't that have been great? There was also a marvelous ministry of informal preaching going on. Do you know that informal preaching is often the best kind? If I could remind you, just go back to verse 20 of Acts chapter 11. What does it say there in verse 20? But some of them who were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, when they had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. That speaking and preaching the Lord Jesus, that informal preaching, listen, that is some of the best preaching that ever happens. 
Listen, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll just speak. I, I know some of you, God has given you preaching and teaching ministries, and God uses it, but, but I'll just speak to you as if that wasn't the case. And I'll just say this. If I have a ministry of more formal teaching, you grab onto that ministry of informal preaching. God will give you the opportunities. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to know everything. You, you just have to know who Jesus is and what he's done in your life. The, the, the person and work of Jesus and be able to explain it. But make no mistake about it. I think that a healthy, strong, vibrant church is built on both of those pillars. Formal preaching, a good, strong pulpit ministry, if I could say that. But then also dynamic, informal preaching from among the congregation. And that's exactly what was going on in Antioch. So much so, and isn't this exciting? Look at it there in verse 26. So much so that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Do you understand that before this, nobody called the followers of Jesus Christians? There was a time, there was a place where that label got stuck to the followers of Jesus, and it was right here in Antioch as we read it here in Acts chapter 11. It wasn't until these years among the Christians or among the, the followers of Jesus in Syrian Antioch that the name Christian became associated with the followers of Jesus. Now before this, they had been called disciples. They had been called saints. They had been called believers. They had been called brothers. They had been called witnesses. They had, become they had been called followers of the way. Later on in the book of Acts, they will be called the sect of the Nazarenes. But now in Acts chapter 11, they're going to start to be called Christians. Do you know where that name even comes from? Well, it's a Latin construction, right? Christ, of course, and then Ian at the end. And in Latin, the ending Ian means of the party of or of the group of. So a Christian is of the party of Jesus. You know what it's kind of like saying? It's like saying Jesusites. It's kind of like saying um, Jesus people. It's describing the people who are associated with Jesus Christ. Uh, one commentator I read, he, he thinks the idea is something like this, saying Christ ones, right? The Christ ones. Now, I also find it interesting that in the ancient Roman world, soldiers under particular generals in the Roman Empire uh, identified themselves by their general's name by adding I-A-N to the end of it. In other words, a soldier under Caesar would call himself a Caesarian. He was identifying himself with his general. Soldiers under Jesus Christ are called Christians. And in Antioch, they first used that term Christian probably to mock the followers of Jesus. We know this from ancient writings that for some reason the people of Antioch were well known for their wittiness in coming up with nicknames and making fun of people and putting, you know, funny tags on. And so it probably started as a mockery. Ha ha, you little Christians. Now when the followers of Jesus heard that, they go, really? You think I'm like Jesus? You call me a Jesus person, a Jesus people, a Christ one? Hey, I'll take that. And they liked it so much that the name stuck. That's how it should be with us people. People should look at us and be able to say, well, Jesus person, follower of Jesus, Jesus man, Jesus woman. There's an old commentator like a man named Harry Ironside. And Ironside tells this great story about how when he was traveling in China years ago, this probably would have been during the 20s or 30s, when he was traveling in China years ago, he was frequently introduced with the title Yasuyan. Now, he didn't know what that meant. I mean, he wasn't Chinese. He couldn't speak the language. But he asked about it later, and he learned that Yasu was the Cantonese word for Jesus, and Yan was the Cantonese word for man. So when they called him Yasu Yan, they were calling him Jesus Man. Here's Jesus Man. Wouldn't that be great? Have somebody call you Jesus Man, Jesus Woman. Well, that's essentially what they were doing in Antioch. And verse 26 reminds us that they were first called Christians in Antioch. By the way, there's another flavor that we can understand from that. Not only did they begin to be called Christians in Antioch, but how about this? They were first called Christians in Antioch. And what I mean by that, what I'm trying to emphasize that is that they were called Christians before they were called anything else. 
Well, aren't you a citizen of Antioch? First, I'm a Christian. Well, well aren't you uh, a, a, a person who grew up in Greek culture? Yeah, but first, I'm a Christian. Don't you like to go to chariot races? Yeah, but first, I'm a Christian. You get the idea? They were first called Christians in Antioch. And friends, today I think Christians need to be willing to take that title above anything else. We're Jesus people more than anything, and we want to be worthy of that name. Well, whatever other secondary title you might say, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Charismatic, whatever, we should be first called Christians. I love a story from the early church recorded to us by a man named Eusebius. He was a famous early church historian. And he described a believer named Sanctus from Lyon, France. And he was tortured for Jesus. And as they tortured this man named Sanctus very cruelly, they hoped to get him saved something of evil or, or blasphemous. And, and so they asked him his name. What's your name? You know what he answered? I am a Christian. Well, they said, well, what nation do you belong to? You know what he answered? I am a Christian. Well, well uh, what city do you live in? I'm a Christian. His tormentors began to get very angry with him. They said, are you a slave or a free man? I am a Christian, he's replied. That was his only reply, no matter what question they asked him, that was the only thing he would answer. And that made his torturers all the more determined to break him, but they couldn't, and he died with those words on his lips, I am a Christian. But friends, I think it should be so for us. We're first called Christians. That should be our first identity. All right, now let's conclude the chapter here, verse 27. Sort of an interesting aside. It says, And in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it by the elders, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now this is very interesting. Some prophets from Jerusalem, one of them notably a man named Anti uh, Agabus, I should say. They came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and as they're there among the Christians, they had a message announcing that there would be a great famine throughout the world, and it would happen during the days of this particular Roman emperor. We don't know exactly how this man Agabus showed by the spirit that the famine was on the way, but the Christians took the word seriously, and they generously prepared to meet the coming need. And so what did it say? Verse 29, then the disciples, it says that they gave each according to their ability. Now friends, this kind of blows my mind. Here you have Christians 300 miles north of Jerusalem. They hear about a need that's coming, and their immediate instinct is, what can we do to help our brethren in Jerusalem? These were Christians that came from a totally pagan background. You would think that in some ways they did not have much common. They didn't have much language common. They didn't have much culture common. They didn't have much uh, religious background common. I'll tell you, the only thing they had in common was Jesus Christ himself. And that was greater than any of the differences that they might possess. And when they came together with that common ground, they said, we need to help our brothers and sisters in Judea. And so what did they do? It says in verse 29 that they each gave according to their ability. That's really great. Notice that phrase again in verse 29. They gave according to their ability. They gave according to the ability of their resources. If I could put it frankly, those who had more gave more. Those who had less gave less. Now, it also means that they gave according to the ability of their faith, trusting that God's work was a worthy investment in his kingdom and not a loss. Listen, so friends, I'm blessed. I'm blessed by the generous hearts we have in our congregation. But I just want this to be continually true of us. That people give according to their ability, not only their ability in a proportional sense, but also the ability of their faith. But you know what else I like about this? In verse 29, it says that they determined to give. I think that's common, isn't it? If you don't determine to give, you probably won't. If you leave it up to the casual moment, well, will I or won't I? I don't know. I'll make up my mind at the moment. No? It says right there in verse 29 that they determined to give. 
And so verse 30 says that they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The very high regard that Barnabas and Saul had among all was evident by the fact that they were trusted with this relief fund and they were sent out. And friends, I have to say this. I can't say it categorically because I, I don't know everything about ancient history. But based on some fairly reliable sources that I've read, this is the first recorded act of charitable assistance of this nature ever in ancient literature. Again, I can't say that categorically because I don't know all ancient literature. But, but from the surveys that I've read, you're not going to find other examples of this where people from a different country, from a different culture, oh, people have always helped their kin, right? People have always helped people right next to them or, or people around them. But to say 300 miles away, we're going to help people that we don't even know, we don't even share the same race, we don't even share the same language, we don't even share the same customs, but what we share is Jesus, and that makes us want to help them. No wonder they were called Christians in Antioch. Now, friends, what about us? Some people wonder, should we call ourselves Christians? Maybe it's better in our common day to call ourselves followers of Jesus. Maybe it's better to call ourselves disciples, or people of the way, whatever you would want to give it. Maybe it's a move away from that term Christian. Well, first of all, I've got to say, I like that title Christian. But what would be even more important to me if you want to say, well, I don't want to be called a Christian, I'd rather be called a follower of Jesus, whatever it would be, I just want you to be a Christian. I want you to be a little Christ. Someone who's following him say, he is my allegiance. And most of all, that you would first be called a Christian, right? First. I don't know whatever allegiances you have, your political ideas, your economic ideas, your, your uh, things you'd like to do for hobbies or fun, whatever business associations you have, so on and so on and so on. All those things can be great, they can be important in your life, and that's wonderful, but first, but first, be called a Christian a little Jesus, a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what changed Antioch. This one city in this distant corner of the Roman world, friends, that one city is going to be a pump that sends out the gospel all over the shores of the Mediterranean. All over. And I have to say, it didn't come from Jerusalem. It came from Antioch. And right now, the scene is shifting in the book of Acts from having a very Jerusalem-centered focus to now having an Antioch-centered focus. We see the way that the work of God was happening right there. We don't doubt why. Well, friend, let's pray and ask that God would do just such a work among us. Father, I think of uh, that city, Antioch, and how you did such a marvelous work among the followers of Jesus there. That your grace was so evident. That the atmosphere of grace was so real. That Jesus, um, that they were first called Christians in that city. Lord, I, I want it to be so among us. I sense that, that it is, at least in part, Lord. But we want it to abound more and more. And so, Lord, I pray that your grace, your unmerited love and favor, would pour out upon hearts, that people would see it and receive it and be glad. 